Good evening, a Gemar Chasimatoiva to each and every one of you. Tonight and tomorrow is the day of the Yud Gimel Midas Harachamim in the Selichos. We know that it's a day that's the pismen that said out loud after the three that are just said and we conclude and we move on to the next one that the fifth day of Slichos during Aseris Yemei Tshuva is always the Yud Gil Midas Arachamim and that's when many Yechassidish Rebbes and many people go to Tashlich and tomorrow in the parks said Prospect Park and by the ocean, you'll see many, many Yidden who come to do Tashlich and have said in shul either at night or the next morning. The Yud Gimel Midas Arachamim. Now, there is a Pusik that we say a bakosha v'solachto lavoneinu ki ravhu that v'solachto lavoneinu that we ex express a supplication that Hashem you should forgive lavoneinu our averis our sins ki ravhu because they are many and Yom Kippur has that magic that it not only forgives, it never happened. Now, there is a touch that I heard from the old Skull Rebbe, who was Nifter around 42 or 43 years ago. But he once quoted, and I do not remember who he quoted, but he said that there is a machloikas in the Gemara, a difference of opinion between Rav and Shmuel, that if a person comes in to Bezdin and they are moide biknas, that means they did something that requires a fine. Now, if they come into Besden and they admit that they did X, Y, and Z, so the actual money they have to pay back, but they are exempt from the knas. So holds Rav. Shmuel holds the opposite that if they come in, the man comes in and admits that he doesn't pay any knas. But if, let's say, the next day two witnesses come in to Bezin and they say that that guy did this and this, which requires repayment and the actual fine, then even though the guy comes in himself and admits it, he still has to pay the fine, according to Shmuel. But according to Rav, once he comes in and admits in Bezdin that he's guilty of this and that, then there's no knas. And even if two witnesses come in and say he was guilty of doing X, Y, and Z. According to Shmuel, he still has to pay the knas. But according to Rav, he doesn't because moide beknas is potter, and even if the two aid him come afterwards, which means that they substantiate that he did something wrong. It, 
and then be Adam comes. So the two Adam really, we don't care if he admitted or didn't. Rob says we do care. And if he came in and admitted before the Adam came, are you going to hold that the whole time? Mm -hmm. So he is Potter. So the Scholar Rebbe touched the Salachto Lavonenu. Please forgive our the bushel basket of Averis. Ki Ravu, because we paskin like Rav, that now that we're admitting and we're asking for Mechila, so even if all the Mechatrigim and Shemayim stand up and say this Avera, that Avera, that we are covered by the Moide Beknas of Rav, and we are Potter, that we should not be listened to by those who are the naysayers, the cynics, and all the Malachi Chabola, and all the Mekatrigim. The Salachta Lavonenu Ki Ravu. And it's a, a very big encouragement because we see repeated in all sorts of fashion how choshev and how important Yom Kippur in and of itself is. The, for instance, I spoke to you about the fact that not only are we forgiven, but it's forgotten. Now we come into Kol Nidre, the first thing that we say Yom Kippur night, and it's very serene. I mean, the two Sifrei Torah are taken out and they're walked around the shul in perfect silence and everyone kisses the Sifrei Torah. And we then say Kol Nidre, which basically an annulment. And we come into Rosh Hashanah also, we have our Taurus Nadarim before Rosh Hashanah, because we don't want to come in to begin the davening on Rosh Hashanah that we have not disavowed and dissolved Nadorim, because that's the one thing that could really come to haunt us. So before Rosh Hashanah, we have Kon, we have Hataras Nadorim, and we have, Motz, we have the Leil Yom Kippur Kol Nidre, Again, about vows and promises and uh, giving the word and being positive. So, because it sets the stage for what the theme of Yom Kippur is. Because what is Hataras Nadarim? If someone makes during the year a neder and they decide that they can't keep it or there's a problem, they go and there's a best of three and they are mater neder. They find a Pesach Lacharota, a way of getting the man out of it. And once he's out, it's clean. It never happened because it's dissolved. And that's the theme of Yom Kippur, that we not only dissolve, as I said, the bushel basket of Averis, they are forgotten, just like the concept of Neder. And that's why we say Kol Nidre, the opening tefillah of Yom Kippur. Now, we know that I mentioned to you that every Mesechta has its name on the Mesechta. Pesach is called Psochem, Sukkah is called Sukkah. Um, 
Rosh Hashanah is called Rosh Hashanah, and that's the name. But the name of the Masechta, the Gemara that deals with um, Yom Kippur is Yuma, day, day. Which day that it's so high, you can't even point to it and identify it because it's completely above, <coughs> excuse me, and ab above and beyond this world. Because it's the only day of the year that the Sultan has no permission to prosecute and step forward to hurt the Yidden. The Sultan has only 364 days a year that he's allowed to do that, but not on Yom Kippur. Now, if you remember, when Avram Avinu was Nifter, and he was Nifter at age 175, he was supposed to live to 180, just like his son Yitzchak lived. But Hashem did him a favor, the Medrash and Rashi brings the Medrash, that Ace of his grandson went out Latarbus Raw. He went out and in one day, he, he killed someone, he raped a Menara Rosa, who's considered like a married woman. And there were five things that he did that day. And Hashem did not want him to have to witness this and, and feel the pain and grief that this is what one of his grandsons turned out to be. So Avram Avinu died five, he was Nifter five years before the 180s. He was only 175. Now, the day that Asaph did this was the day that Avram Avinu was buried. And he came home after doing all of these Averis so famished that like the Chazal say that another 10 minutes he would have been dead. So Yaakov Avinu was cooking soup because we know that if somebody loses a relative, Lo aleinu, lo aleichem, that he's obligated to sit Shiva, that when he goes to the cemetery and buries the relative, he comes home, he has to eat something that somebody else prepared for him, and it has to be round, either eggs or lentils, uh, beans that have like a round shape to it, and it's a um, reminder that every person lives his life and then he comes back uh, and there's a return like round, like a wheel that turns because he has to accomplish what his mission was. And if he didn't accomplish it properly, he has to come back again. So Yaakov Avina was making these lentils to feed to his father Yitzchak, who had just buried their father. And in comes Esav and says to Yaakov, he was so like delirious that he couldn't even say the word soup. He just said, Halitaini no min ha'adom ha'adom, that red stuff that's there. Give me from it because I'm famished and I'm going about to die. I'm about to die. So Yaakov Avinu said to him, Michra Chayom Li Esbecho that I want you today to sell to me and agree to the sale of the birthright.
And without batting an eyelash, Asaf said, yeah, keep it, take it. And the trade-off was the, all the soup for the birthright. So Mephorshim in that Pasuk in Sefer Bereshis asks, what's this word kayom? That means he could have just said, Michra li especha Sell me your birthright and I'm going to give you the soup and pay for it. Why did he say the word kayom? Sell to me like today. What do you mean like today? So the answer is that Esav lived for the day. He had no cheshben of olam haba, or that we do things so that we should be able to make a nachas ruach ta'kodesh baruch Hu, or to have something substantiated by the fact that the person does the mitzvah with love and with fear and with everything else in bringing a a strong response from heaven that this person's entitled to this and this. He did such a mitzvah. He wasn't worried about the mitzvahs. He was worried about what can I enjoy and have today? The hayom, the hayom, the actual today. Klal Yisrael, we learn Torah, we do mitzvahs, and we do lots of chesed, but it's not for today. Today we do the mitzvah, but it's for the Olam Haba, it's for the Nachas Ruach Tarkodesh Baruch So it was two separate worlds. So the Mepharshim explained that Yaakov Avinu said that, Mechroli, Chayom, sell me the birthright because it all it amounts to in your life is Hayom, today what you can grab, what you can do, what you can enjoy. It has nothing to do with Asidus and Gula Shlema, with any of these things. So if the Hayom is such a category, then sell it to me. And he sold it to him. Vayimkor Esav es bechoroso liyakov, viyakov, Nosam la Esav, lechem unazid adoshim, vayochal vayesht vayivez Esav es habachora. If that's the case, then we can understand why Mesechtas Yuma is called Yom. Yuma in Aramaic is Yom, the day. Doesn't specify the day. Because Yom Kippur is a complete day of Ruchnius. It's nothing that we can point to like Esav. Oh, I'm doing this now and I love doing this and this is my whole tafkid in living. But it's the Yom that Klal Yisrael looks at the entire life as one gift from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the gift that we give back to our Kodesh Baruch Hu is all of the avoida, all of the actual service that we do daily and every week and every month and every year. So when we call the Masechta Yuma, it's a remise to the difference of activity the backbone of Claudius Yisrael of why we exist and what we see as the fruits of our labor, a lifetime of Gan Eden, and that can't be pointed to the way the Yom of Asaph can be pointed to, and this is why I'm living and this is all I want out of life. The Saporna discusses this concept, and for those of you who are interested 
to look further into this Indian, please turn to the Supurna in Baratius on the story of Yaakov and Esau. Now, we know that we do not live a life of patting ourselves on the back. That a Yid has to constantly grow, has to constantly become better, has to constantly dedicate himself to what he has to do and how he has to do it. And we move on. We do what's important. And we don't sit there, oh, how great I am, boy, I just did such a mitzvah. It was, and we see this, as I mentioned to you around five months ago, that when Aaron HaKoyen, and we laid it on Yom Kippur, Parchas Mos, that when Aaron HaKoyen came out, of the Kodesh Kedoshim on Yom Kippur, and he accomplished and achieved his goal on behalf of Klal Yisrael with all of the Avoidah included in his activities. And suddenly the white string, which was red the whole time, became white. And that it attested to the fact that there was a kapara, an atonement for Klal Yisrael. Aaron came out and went back to the people, but before he did that, he buried the clothes right there that he wore when he was in the Kodesh Kedoshim. And the Dorshe Rishumos say that it's a remez that when a Yid accomplishes something, Aaron accomplished for the whole quality so they made sudas that night they danced it was a a national celebration for what was accomplished he went on to his next avoid he didn't come there to see how great i am there were many kohanim gedolim that died in the kodesh kedoshim i didn't die and I accomplished what I had to do for all of you. He wasn't talking about that. He set his sights to what the next chaluk of Avoida is and what he had to do next. So when we do some good things and we know it's a nachas ruach and we have an inner glow that Baruch Hashem, we were zoicha to this or that and we accomplished or did it very properly and very wholesomely, we can't walk around like, I accomplished, I did, I'm so happy with myself. That's not the, and that's why it says, Vihinicham Sham. He took off the clothes that he wore in the Kodesh Kodoshim, Vihinicham Sham, and he buried them there, meaning the accomplishment of the day he didn't bask in the luster of pride and joy because of the achievement. And that's Vihinicham Sham. We should learn for ourselves that each and every day has its own challenges and that we have to thrive, not just strive, but thrive with the past and propel ourselves and project ourselves into the next mission and accomplish that. Now, we know that Yom Kippur is referred to, you know, when we talk about Purim and we talk about Yom Kippur, so we say, the Zohar Kodesh says, Yom Kippur that Yom Kippur is big, but it's not as big as Purim is. It's Yom Kippur, like, like Purim, but it's not as big as Purim. Now, there are aspects of, and in Lyos and Lavo, it'll only be Purim that has the full system 
and the full array of mitzvahs that we do today that will continue exactly like that after Mashiach comes. Yom Kippur and Pesach, if it's in the Torah, it will continue. But it doesn't mean it'll be the exact same format. And that's why the Medrash says that all the Yom Tovim will be bottled be, except for Purim. And bottle doesn't mean it will disappear. It means it will disappear in the mode and in the formation of how we live through the day before Mashiach comes and after Mashiach comes. We'll do, we'll also do it, but it may not be the exact format. And that's why it says that all the Yom Tov will be um, will cease to exist as they existed before Mashiach came. Now, why am I saying this to you? Because the day before Purim, we fast, and the next day we feast. Lots of eating, lots of simcha, and in the aspect of Kapara, Yom Kippur remains rare and remarkable in its distinction. And that is the reason, according to some Kavvoinim, and we know that to eat Arab Yom Kippur is a mitzvah saseh diaraisa, and every meal and every chew and every drink that we swallow some liquid and the more liquid and more, everything is a big, big, everything's a separate mitzvah, tremendous mitzvahs. And one of the reasons, because it would seem that we fast before Purim, but the next day we eat, because Purim's a bigger day and eating can be bigger than fasting if we're mala all the neshamas that are in the food, with our kavanas, with our deeper machshava, deeper maisa. So therefore the mitzvah of eating Arab Yom Kippur, because you see there's a mitzvah to eat Arab Yom Kippur, and there's a very big Indian to make a very big sunta, Motsoi Yom Kippur. As Shlomo HaMelech said. So it comes out that someone, the Gemara says, who eats Arab Yom Kippur, he gets credit as if he fasted two days. The Gemara says, Ha'oichel b'chi, that if someone eats Erev Yom Kippur, ke'ilu hisana, he is given credit. In Shemayim, ke'ilu hisana, as if he fasted, chi'i va'asiri, the ninth day of Tishri and the tenth day. That means he gets a double credit as if he fasted two days just by virtue of fasting Yom Kippur and eating Erev Yom Kippur. So the Meforshim say that it's true that there are aspects of Purim which will be bigger, but to make sure that you didn't think that that left Yom Kippur in some sort of dejected second tier, secondary level of what it is, you therefore were given the mitzvah Erev Yom Kippur to eat and the Motsoi, and they are all three mitzvahs, the day, the day itself and the Erev Yom Kippur, that's too fast, and then the Motsoi Yom Kippur, that in that respect, it tells you that as Choshev as Purim is, but Yom Kippur in this aspect, in forging ahead with the Kapara and forgetting about the Averas, ends up happening in its full glory and full flourish. And some say that when we talk about 
Shalos Saudos, which usually means Shabbos afternoon, that we eat Shalos Shudas. So many Titans say that when we have a remez to Shalos Saudos, it's the eating of air of Yom Kippur, which becomes a fast, and the day of Yom Kippur itself, which is a fast, and then the Motsoi Yom Kippur, that's the Shalosh Saudos. And Yom Kippur is a day that really we, we not only thrive, but we, we, the thrust of the Hashivas of the day is so big that that's how we can come in. Because a person, let's say, who's shvach, he can't go on a 10-mile marathon without some preparation, getting a little bit into proper form or drinking a lot before he runs. That it doesn't just happen that you push a button that you have to be in proper form. And to come into the, the days of Sukkot and the four days connected to Shema Vaya between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, you need a tremendous elevation. And through those fasting apparatus of the air of Yom Kippur by eating and Yom Kippur itself, we can then end up in that realm of the level of simply, you know, the Vilna Gon used to say that the hardest mitzvah that he had in his lifetime was the mitzvah of Simcha on Sukkot. Because it says in one Pasik, Vesamachta Bechayacha, and another Pasik says, Usmachtem Lifnei Hashem Elokeichem. Shivas Yomim. And a third Pasik says, Vahoyiso Ach Sameach. So there's three Lashoinus of Simcha and Sukkis. And the Vilnagon said that the hardest mitzvah that he had in his lifetime to fulfill was the mitzvah of Simcha and Sukkis. Because the three Psukim it actually translates to mean that a person has to be 24-7 v'simcha. He can't just sit down and suddenly smile or laugh for five minutes and take a cup of wine and be yoitza simcha, the Vilna Gron said, that a person has to be 24 hours, seven days of the week v'simcha. And that was his hardest mitzvah. We're talking about the Vilna Gaon. And that's what he had to say. Now, I will be speaking as a Hashem after Yom Kippur. I was not planning on making another tape, a video, but I am going to uh, the day after Yom Kippur. And I'm going to include the Inyone Sukkot, which really I did not speak about Sukkot tonight. Um, and we're going to explain a lot of things like the Baal Shem Tov says, that only mikvah and Sukkah are the two mitzvahs that you go in with your complete body. And it's all encompassing. And the fact that we have the Schach, which is the Shechina, you know, during Kolomoy, if something fell off from the schach, if you had a decoration or you had, you're not allowed to put it back, it's muksa, because you can't touch the schach, the schach is the shechina. And we're going to go into the realm of what the Ushbizen and Hoshana Rabbah is, Be'ezus Hashem. But meantime, what I do want to say to each and every one of you, Grab the opportunity, seize the opportunity. Don't be looking at the clock. How much time is left to get out as if it's a plague. You can't wait till you get out of Yom Kippur. It's a beautiful day, a day of a matana, a beautiful gift from HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Klal Yisrael and that we should use it wisely and we should not be uh, in a position of wasting with 
idle talk and even if they give you a break an hour or two in shul say till and do things that are worthy of if you're tired it'll be over soon it's not two days Rosh Hashanah it's one day Yom Kippur so for one day you'll be able to, to sleep don't let the Eight Sahara take the precious moments and minutes and hours of Yom Kippur and drag you into the mud with it that you'll be talking with someone half of it lush and harder don't go that route on a day that is so kadosh everyone should have an easy fast and everyone should be able to see Maisi Yodai Lispoir that the tshuva is received and accepted and that the bushel baskets that I always refer to are absolutely dissolved and are bottle umavutl kahaf erodiara and there is no memory of it for the person his entire upcoming year. A gemar chasima tova. Now that I wished you a Gemar Chasima Toiva for Yom Kippur, I just want to conclude with a short vort from Tzadikim that this Parsha this week is Parsha Hazinu, and everything is in the world, like the Russia Avner asked the Ramban, show me where and you say everything's in Hazinu. Show me where I'm mentioned. And he told them, the Pasuk, Amarti Afeyam Ashbisa Me'enosh Zichrom. The third letter spells, of each word spells Avner. So he showed him where his name was actually in the, in the Sedra. Now, at the beginning of Hazinu, it says, Ki Shem Hashem Ekra, and we usually say it before we begin Mincha, Shemon Esrei. And before we say Hashem Sefasai Tiftach, Ufi Yagid Tehila Secha. That at that point, we introduce as the opening statement this Pasach, Kishem Hashem Ekra, Havu Godel Elokeinu is in Hazinu. Now, what does the Pasuk mean? Kishem Hashem Ekra, when I'll call out the name of God. Havu Godel Elokeinu, it will bring greatness to our God. So, Tzadikim asked that The name Elokeinu is like Elokim, it's Midas Hadin. So how does it fit into that Pasuk? So the Tzaddikim explain the Pasuk like this. Ki Shem Hashem Ekra, whenever I will say the Shem Havaya, Yudke Vovke, <coughs> excuse me, the name of God, Havu Godel, I will bring Chesed Lelo Kenu, because Lelo Kenu is like Elokim, Midas Adin. Now, Godel, we see in the Pasuk in Vayavarach David, we say it every day in Davening, that Lecha Hashem Hagedula, Vahagevura, Vahateferes, Vahanetzach, Vahahod that the first word used is gedula, and that's in place of the word chesed. When we say chesed, gevura, teferes, netzachon, it starts with the word chesed, but in this Pasik, it's gedula, l'cho Hashem ha-gedula, then v'ha-gevura, v'ha-teferes. So, the Rebbeim Taich, Ki Shem Hashem Ekra, when I am masked the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Yud Kei Vav Kei, 
which is the highest level of chesed and rachamim for Klal Yisrael, havu godel, we bring chesed, leilokeinu, to the midas adin, to elokeinu or elokim, that it's a midas adin, and that brings to it the, the, the power of chesed, and it drenches it with chesed. And so they touch the tzaddikim, they touch the inyan of the two chalas that we take and everything that we do in the aser tzimei tshuva is to bring havu godel lelokeinu, to bring a sweetness of chesed and rachamim to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to be mamtik and to sweeten the dinim and turn them from bitterness and severity and strictness into the power of chesed. Havu godel leilokeinu. A good yamtiv and a gemar chasimah